Let's resume our verse-by-verse journey through God's Word by opening to Ezekiel chapter 29 today. Verse number 1 has a chronological notation. It says, In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month. So that's the tenth year of Zedekiah and the uh, twelfth day of the tenth month of the Jewish year. So uh, when we calculate that all back in our chronology, we end up with uh, somewhere in December of 589 B.C. So effectively, we're about a year after the siege of Jerusalem began. And Ezekiel, who is up in uh, Mesopotamia, not very far from Babylon City, gets a message from the Lord about the situation that's happening down south. And it's related to another player in all of this, and that'd be the Pharaoh of Egypt. You might remember that after the Babylonian siege started in uh, 590, that very soon uh, in the spring of the following year, the new Pharaoh showed up to try to run the Egyptians off. And instead of running the Egyptians, excuse me, instead of running the Babylonians off, the Babylonians ran the Egyptians off. And so not very long after that, God sends this message through the prophet, and it probably is written down and uh, sent to Egypt. So in the 10th year, 10th month, 12th day of the month, the word of he who is came to me, son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus says he who is God. Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh of Egypt. So God is basically saying, I'm not on your side. You need to stay out of the picture. The great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams that says, my Nile is my own. Uh, Now, it's very ancient imagery that pictures Egypt as a dragon, uh, a dinosaur, if you will. One of the great big uh, uh, dinosaurs that likes to run around in the water as well. Uh, The name that we sometimes see is Rahab. Uh, It's spelled R-A-H-A-B, and it's a water dragon is the idea here. Uh, It's probably related to Tiamat, which was the great dragon of chaos in uh, the Mesopotamian mythology. So Egypt is portrayed as this great mythical dragon that causes trouble, chaos. And uh, God says, yeah, you like to lay there in your Nile River and think you are everything. But it says here, I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales, and I will draw you up out of the midst of your streams with all the fish on your sc- uh, of your streams that stick to your scales. So the picture here is that this monster of a dragon, this, this river dragon, uh, has creatures attached to it from the Nile. And so God says, I'm going to drag you right straight out of your Nile, out of your place where you think you're king. Verse 5, And I will cast you out into the wilderness which from Egyptian standpoints, that's desert. You and all the fish of your streams, and you shall fall on the open field and not be brought together or gathered. To the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the heaven, I give you as food. So this is God's warning to Egypt. I am going to deal with you and all your little allies, all your little military commanders. I am going to give you as food to the scavenger animals. I'm going to let you be killed. Verse 6, Then all the inhabitants of earth, uh, of Egypt, shall know that I am he who is. So the point is, God's in charge, not the Pharaoh of Egypt. 
because you have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they grasped you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. And when they leaned on you, you broke and made all their loins to shake. A little bit of a hard mental picture for us. Uh, the reeds that we typically think of be like cattails and things like that. These reeds are a little bit more substantial than that, sometimes used as walking sticks. But in this case, God says, you are an unfaithful, untrustworthy walking stick that Egypt, excuse me, that Judah, the remaining house of Israel, have looked to for assistance. Most recently, they thought that when the new Pharaoh came up against the Babylonians, that they'd be safe. But instead, the Babylonians chased the Egyptians away. And so all the hopes of the Judeans have been crushed again. It's as if that walking stick they had snapped off in their hand and poked them uh, in the leg. Verse number eight, Therefore, thus says he who is God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon you, and I will cut off from you man and beast, and the land of Egypt shall be a desolation and a waste. Then they will know that I am he who is. So God makes the prediction through Ezekiel that Egypt is going to bear a hefty price for sticking their nose in here. And they will. Uh, even though Nebuchadnezzar will never fully take Egypt as his own. He'll never be able to draw it into his growing empire. He will do a lot of damage to them uh, and leave uh, economic and uh, environmental and personnel uh, devastation behind him. Uh, continuing, because you said the Nile is mine and I made it, therefore, behold, I am against you and against your streams, and I will make the land of Egypt an utter waste and desolation from Migdol to Seini. Uh, basically, from the north to the south, as far as the border of Kush. Kush is modern-day Ethiopia. Uh, no foot of man shall pass through it, and no foot of beast shall pass through it. It will be uninhabited 40 years. So there will be parts of Egypt that will be so impacted by the damage done uh, at the hands of the Babylonians that People won't even be there for 40 years. I will make the land of Egypt a desolation in the midst of desolated countries. Because Babylon is going to take down countries all over the place. So Egypt will be one of them that will suffer. Uh, and uh, her city shall be a desolation 40 years among cities that are laid waste. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them through the countries. So pretty much the same thing that's happening to a lot of these these countries under Egypt, excuse me, Babylonian domination. People are taken into exile. They're relocated. So there will be the relocation of some Egyptians. Uh, verse number 13. For thus says he who is God, at the end of 40 years, I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered, and I will restore the fortunes of Egypt and bring them back to the land of Pathros, the land of their origin, and there they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the most lowly of the kingdoms and never again exalt itself among the nations. And I will make them so small that they will never again rule over the nations. And it shall never again be the reliance of the house of Israel, recalling their iniquity when they turn to them for aid. Then they will know that I am he who is God. So when the media Persian empire comes to the forefront at the end of the Babylonian influence, a lot of the ethnic Egyptians will be released, just like will happen with the Judeans, the Jewish people. Uh, they'll be released and be allowed to go back home again. But God predicts through Jeremiah, excuse me, through Ezekiel, that never again will the ethnic Egyptians be the monstrous powerhouse that they once were. Uh, they are not going to be an empire any longer. Now, we will later in history talk about the uh, Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt. 
but that is not a native Egyptian dynasty. That's actually Greek. Uh, and so even when Egypt does come back up on the world scene later, it's not ethnic Egyptians. And even to this date uh, that we're living in right now, ethnic Egyptians have not really been big power players in world politics. And because of this passage, I don't ever expect them to be so. Uh, let's uh, go down to the next chapter because we've already uh, seen that there is a, uh, uh, there is a chronological uh, notation in the next verse that comes later. So chapter number 30, verse 1. The word of he who is came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says he who is God. Well, alas for the day, for the day is near. The day of he who is is near. It will be a day of clouds, a day of doom for all the nations. Uh, this is a lamentation. Uh, the day of the Lord, we're in the habit of when we hear that phrase, we immediately move book of Revelation, end of time. Uh, but that phrase has been used in the past about any cataclysmic uh, end of a society. And so this is uh, more of this lamentation over the coming judgment of God at the hand of the Babylonians against Egypt. Verse 4, a sword shall come up upon Egypt and anguish shall come, uh, shall be in Cush. So Egypt is an independent nation, but Cush is often allied with it. It's Ethiopia. Uh, when the slain fall in Egypt and her wealth is carried away and her foundations are torn down. So that's going to be happening at least in part uh, because of Nebuchadnezzar. Cush, so Ethiopia, Put and Lud and all Arabia and Libya. These are areas uh, around or associated with Egypt. And the people of that land that is in a league shall fall with them by the sword. Thus says he who is, those who support Egypt shall fall and her proud might shall come down from Migdol, the north, to Syene, south. They shall fall within her by the sword, declares he who is, and they shall be desolated in the midst of desolated countries and their cities shall be in the midst of cities that are laid waste. Then they will know that I am he who is when I set fire to Egypt and all her helpers are broken. So when Nebuchadnezzar comes and puts his big heavy boot in the middle of things and causes trouble, that's when this gets uh, fulfilled. Uh, On that day, messengers shall go out from me in ships to terrify the unsuspecting people of Cush, and anguish shall come upon them on the day of Egypt's doom, for behold, it comes. So rumors of war will even play a part in, in making people scared and running away. Thus says he who is God, I will put an end to the wealth of Egypt by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. There it is in black and white. This is fulfilled because of Nebuchadnezzar. He and his people with him, the most ruthless of nations, shall be brought in uh, to destroy the land. They shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. That's, again, the idea of drawing out the great big monster of Egypt with all its associated fish, uh, and all of it's going to die. All of it's going to be killed uh, in the sense that they will lose their power. I will dry up the Nile and will sell the land into the hand of evildoers. I will bring desolation upon the land and everything in it by the hand of foreigners. I am he who is. I have spoken. So this is judgment from God against a sinful Egypt. Thus says he who is God, I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images in Memphis. That's not Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Egypt, which is near the Nile. It's not very far from the modern city of Cairo. There shall no longer be a prince from the land of Egypt, so I will put fear in the land of Egypt. It's interesting that right around this time, we're going to have 
some chaotic transfer between dynasties uh, in Egypt. Uh, I will make Pathros a desolation and will set fire to Zoan and will execute judgments on Thebes. All these are places along the Nile in Egypt. I will pour out my wrath on Pelusium, the stronghold of Egypt. Pelusium is the northeast uh, corner of the delta, and it was a fortified border town. Uh, and cut off the multitude of Thebes, and I will set fire to Egypt. Pelusium shall be in great agony. Thebes shall be breached. Thebes is way down in the south. And Memphis shall face enemies by day. The young men of On, which the name you might recognize better for this is Heliopolis. Uh, it was a city devoted to the sun, uh, so all the different names to it are related to the sun. Uh, and so it's not very far again from modern city of Cairo uh, near the delta. Uh, the young men of On and of Pibeset shall fall by the sword, and women shall go into captivity. And to Hapanes, the day shall be dark when I break there the yoke bars of Egypt, and her proud shall come out to an end in her. She'll be covered by a cloud. Her daughters shall go into captivity, and thus I will execute judgments on Egypt. Then they will know that I am he who is. So Egypt, because they stuck their nose in, because they've been involved in sinful activities, they also will come under the judgment of God uh, at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. At this juncture, uh, I'd like for us to go back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 26. Uh, sometimes we have to bounce around to get the chronological order here, and this is one of those cases. The date that appears here at the very beginning is this. In the 11th year, that'd be the 11th of, uh, of Zedekiah, on the first day of the month, uh, now we don't know which month this is, I suggest to you, based on some other passages that come in Ezekiel, it might be the first month of the year. And if that is the case, then we are talking about uh, April of 588 uh, B.C. In the eleventh year, first day of the month, the word of he who is came to me. Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha! The gate of the peoples is broken. It's swung open to me. I will be replenished now that she's laid waste. Uh, now, a lot of these things, I think, are in written form, by the way, because we know that during this time period, uh, e uh, Ezekiel is supposed to be remaining mute. So he's probably releasing these prophecies in written form. Tyre is on the coast of the Mediterranean, a little bit north of the Promised Land. And so that means it's quite a few days sail north of the uh, Judean coast. Uh, but they see the recent uh, besiegement of Jerusalem by the Babylonians as an opportunity for them that maybe they'll be able to um, pick up slaves and uh, recovered goods cheaply soon. So they don't really care about the people. They only care about the bottom line for themselves. Uh, there's other sins going on and having gone on in Tyre. So God has decided to let them know they've got theirs coming. So this is the message that goes to them from Ezekiel. Therefore, thus says he who is God, Behold, I'm against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you as the sea breaks, uh, brings up its waves. Uh, Tyre uh, starts out as a mainland city with an offshore associated island. And so they're quite familiar with the breaking of waves all over that island and all over their shoreline. So God says, look, Tyre, 
because of your bad attitude, I'm going to be bringing a whole bunch of nations against you like waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. Now, that's the mainland that that's going to happen to under Nebuchadnezzar. The mainland city of Tyre is going to be destroyed because of Nebuchadnezzar. But then this next part is interesting because it jumps far ahead in history to Alexander the Great, who comes against the same people group, and they all go hide on their little island offshore and taunt him, saying, you're not going to get us. And so he says, yes, I will. And so he does this next thing that God predicted. Here it is. I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. So later, Alexander the Great will take the debris of the mainland tire and shove it out into the ocean, out into the Mediterranean Sea, and make a causeway out to this island offshore and uh, besiege and defeat that city of Tyre. And uh, that is why today, if you look closely at the coastland there, uh, there is no island anymore. It's part of the mainland because of this, this joining of the two with the debris of ancient Tyre. Uh, she shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets. So a place where fishermen lay out their nets. For I have spoken, declares he who is God, and she shall become plunder for the nations, and her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. Then they will know that I am he who is. So judgment comes upon all of the nations surrounding Judea that seem to be happy that they're being taken down by the Babylonians. And so God says, Babylonians are going to take you down too. Verse 7, For thus says he who is God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings. Zero doubt, that's historical. With horses and chariots, with horsemen and a host of many soldiers, he will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. And you can picture all of that happening with the military, you know, having their shields up over their heads as they're coming against the wall. Uh, He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls. And with his axes, he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. So all the horses running around up and down the coast as they're carrying out military operations, raise this dust, which then blows over and settles upon the people that are besieged. Uh, With the hoofs of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timber and soil they will cast into the midst of the waters. That's again Alexander the Great that does that hundreds of years later. I will stop the music of your songs and the sound of your lyres will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I am he who is. I've spoken, declares he who is God. And there are archaeological remains there, but nothing's been built on top of them. Thus says he who is the uh, God to Tyre. Will not the coastlands shake at the sound of your fall, when the wounded groan, when slaughter is made in your midst? Uh, the The Tyrians, the people of Tyre, were actually Phoenicians, the famous Phoenicians. And so everybody's going to groan over the end of this Phoenician civilization. Then all 